Good evening and welcome to the Coon Rapids City Council meeting for Tuesday, October 5th, 2021. If you could please rise and join us for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please call the roll. Councilmember Griscoviak. Here. Councilmember Ray Rauer. Here. Councilmember Geisler. Here. Councilmember Johnson. Here. Councilmember Carlson. Here. Mayor Cook. Here. Thank you. Uh, next is to adopt this evening's agenda. So moved. Second. Motion by Geisler, second by Johnson to adopt the agenda. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And the agenda is adopted. And we are up to the approval, item one, the approval of the minutes from the September 21st meeting. Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Geisler. Um, I would like to make a motion to approve the minutes of September 21st, 2021, and recognize Councilmember Demmer for all his hard work. Second. Motion by Geisler, second by Johnson. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six items on the consent agenda this evening. The first one, which is item two, is to approve a 3.2% malt liquor, wine, and strong beer on sale and Sunday liquor license for Famous Dave's Quick Q, 3221 Northdale Boulevard. Uh, Julie Wright Card, a re representative of DTSG Minneapolis, Incorporated has submitted an application uh, for the 3-2% malt liquor, wine, and strong beer on sale and Sunday liquor license. Is that like everything? Can't they just check the box that says all of the above? Um, to be used at 3221 Northdale Boulevard. The license and investigation fees have been paid. The police department is conducting the background investigation. Proof of workers' compensation coverage has been received. And approval of, approval of the license would be conditioned upon a successful background investigation and the Minnesota Department of Public Safety Alcohol and Gambling Enforcement Division's approval, along with a valid food establishment license from Anoka County and a current certificate of insurance evidencing liquor liability coverage. So they still have a bit of a punch list to go through, but... We're looking to approve issuance of the 3.2% malt liquor, wine and strong beer on sale and Sunday liquor licensing to T DTSG Minneapolis Incorporated doing business as Famous Dave's Quick Q located at 3221 Northdale Boulevard Northwest contingent upon the completion of successful background investigation, the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, Alcohol and Gambling Enforcement Division's approval, along with a valid food establishment license from Anoka County and a current certificate of insurance evidencing liquor liability coverage. Um, and that's actually, if you're wondering where 3221 North Hill is, it's basically where Famous Dave's used to be. They're uh, in their new building there, or will be. Um, item three, which is the second item on the consent agenda, is to uh, adopt resolution 21-100, accepting grant funds from the state of Minnesota and approve Minnesota Natural Resources Shade Tree Program Agreement. Um, and this is, uh, we're looking for funding, let's see, uh, we recently submitted an application for funding through the Minnesota Natural Resources Shade Tree Program and were awarded $100,000 from the state to fund this project. These grant dollars will be used to remove and replant boulevard ash trees throughout the city. All boulevards in Coon Rapids are eligible, however, greater emphasis will be given to the priority areas shown on the map that's attached in the agenda. Uh, the city's completed boulevard inventory 2010 to 2014 shows that there are 6,712 boulevard ash trees and over the last 11 years 1,120 of them have already been removed and 1,000 are treated on a two to three year cycle with a balance of 4,592 trees yet to be managed. So this funding is greatly needed. Uh, the grant funds will go entirely to removing and replanting boulevard trees as it relates to emerald ash borer. Uh, the estimated cost to remove and stump grind 125 boulevard ash trees is $62,500. 
and will cost $37,500 to replant um, a total of 125 one and a half inch caliper container trees. The city's in-kind match contribution will be $14,400 for the city, to, the city forester to administer the grant agreement over the course of three years. And the city's portion of the grant is funded through the Boulevard Tree Maintenance Fund. So we're looking to adopt Resolution 21-100, accepting grant funds from the state of Minnesota and authorize execution of the Minnesota Natural Resources Shade Tree Program um, Agreement. Uh, the next item on the consent agenda, which, oh, come on, where are you? We are on item four, there we go, is to approve a 3.2% malt liquor, wine, and strong beer on sale and Sunday liquor license for Aikido Ramen, Coon Rapids, 12465 Riverdale Boulevard, Northwest Suite A. Um, so we're just going to go right to the, uh, we're looking to approve issuance of the 3.2% malt liquor, wine, and strong beer on sale and Sunday liquor licensing to Ishido Ramen, Coon Rapids Incorporated, doing business as Ishido Ramen, Coon Rapids, located at 12465 Riverdale Boulevard, Northwest Suite A. Contingent upon the completion of successful background investigation, the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, Alcohol and Gambling Enforcement Division's approval, along with a valid food establishment license from Anoka County and a current certificate of insurance evidencing liquor liability coverage. And the next item is item five. Um, approve a gambling premises permit for Coon Rapids Lions at the Rose Garden Restaurant, 1925 Coon Rapids Boulevard. Um, so we're looking to adopt Resolution 21-99, a resolution concurring with issuance of a gambling premises permit for the Coon Rapids Lions at Rose Garden Restaurant, 1925 Coon Rapids Boulevard Northwest. And then item six is to adopt Resolution 21-101, approving the levy of 2021 delinquent utilities. Um, so we're looking to adopt Resolution number 21-101, Resolution Certifying Delinquent Utilities to Taxes. And I assume we have a new amount tonight? Yes, we do, yeah. Um, so at this time, it was $898,026. <laughs> Today, Mr. Mayor, it's seven hundred ninety-two thousand seven hundred dollars. Oh, okay. So it's all right. So we didn't have as many pay that. Oh, we still have. We still have till November tenth. No, yep, yeah, November tenth. That's right. All right. So I think I already read this, but we're looking to adopt resolution number twenty-one one hundred one, resolution certifying delinquent utilities to taxes. Item seven is to accept a right of entry agreement with. PCTHS Building Company for the Paladin Career and Technical High School, a proposed charter high school to be located in the former Progressive Insurance Building at 10220 Goldenrod Street. Um, and this is to allow the city uh, the right of entry to periodically enter the property to exercise hydrants and valves and flush the water main system. And, uh, and simply provides the city the ability to ensure the appropriate public safety. Uh, so we're looking to accept the attached right of entry agreement with PCTHS Building Company for Paladin Career and Technical High School, a proposed charter high school to be located at 10220 Goldenrod Street Northwest. And item eight, nope, that's it. That's our whole consent agenda. Councilor Ray Rower. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. second. Motion by Ray Rauer, second by Carlson. Any discussion or questions? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. And now we're on to item eight, which is we're con uh, to consider a public, conduct a public hearing, consider resolution 21-102, giving host approval to the issuance of charter school lease revenue bonds. And uh, Ms. Hansen, did you want to cover this a little bit or do you want me to? Yes, Mr. Mayor, yes. Um, 
This resolution is to grant the City of Independence the um, right to uh, go ahead and issue the conduit bonds to the PCTHS building company. Normally, the City of Coon Rapids um, would do this on their behalf. Um, it is a federal tax law that we do provide this service. However, our, um, if our annual debt is over or at $10 million, um, it isn't designated. Um, it, it, it becomes um, undesignated bonds by the bank, and it would cause the city to have in, in more fees and higher interest rates. So when this happens, the, ask, the company that asks for the conduit debt goes out and finds another city that will grant them rights to do the conduit debt. And um, also under law, the city has to give, the city with jurisdiction has to give them approval. So tonight we're asking you to grant this approval to the City of Independence for them to go ahead and get this conduit debt to build and um, add improvements to um, the charter school that they want to acquire. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any questions about that before we open the public hearing? All right, then hearing none, then we will open the public hearing and uh, to, as we consider resolution 21-102, giving the host approval to the issuance of charter school lease revenue bonds. Is anybody here to address council for the public hearing? This is lively stuff, come on, nobody? <laughs> All right, we're gonna close the public hearing and reserve comments to council. Mr. Mayor. Council Member Geisler. I'll make a motion to adopt resolution 21 Dash 102, giving host approval to the issuance of the charter school lease revenue bonds um, to the City of Independence. Second. Motion by Geisler, second by Carlson. Discussion? Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Griskoviak. I have never seen this done, but we're giving host approval to a different city for uh, construction that's in our city. Has this been done in Coon Rapids before? We did this with the Epiphany Pines or something at this, the Senior Living Center in Epiphany. Okay. They used Champlin to get the bonds mm -hmm. for funding, I don't know how many years ago that was, a few years ago. Okay, and it's because we've already, we're, we're close to that threshold already in Coon Rapids, okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Stemmuddle? Yeah, Mayor Council, it's, it's a fairly common occurrence for municipalities to um, grant approval to another group to um, issue this conduit bond. The incentive for a city like Independence, if you, haven't reached that max, you have that capacity, as you collect some dollars through, there's a fee to be a part of that. And so they, they come out money ahead to do it. Um, occasion we get asked if we have capacity, typically we don't have enough to really offer anybody an incentive, but it's pretty common. Got it. And then a follow up, because Wade's not here. <laughs> I, didn't, uh, I didn't know it was a profit deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm sure Wade would, would, would ask and make, and make sure clarify that the city of Coon Rapids really doesn't incur any risk in, the, in a venture like this. Is that correct? Correct, Mayor and Council, we do not. Right. Yeah. Okay. How long are we going to have Wade questions? Oh, it's going to be a while. <laughs> okay, all right. Just one, that's good. All right. <laughs> any other discussion? No. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. Um, Item nine is to conduct a public hearing for the public body worn camera policy. Chief Wise. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Minnesota statute, one of the requirements before implementing body worn cameras for the police department is that you allow the public an opportunity to weigh in on what that policy will be. Uh, body worn cameras have been around for a while um, and accordingly other agencies have um, um, adopted policies, there's a model policy from the state, but adopted policies regarding their use and have, in my view, vetted most of the problems or issues that might arise from the policy. Um, therefore, we, we put together our policy or our proposed policy and it's been online and we've been taking uh, public input on it. And we have received, I would say, it's something between five and 10 emails uh, with people with a variety of opinions regarding um, some of the policy um, applications that we have. Um, that said, another requirement though is to give people a public forum in the event that they didn't want to send something in writing that I got a chance to come before the council and, and offer suggestions on how our policy should be modified. And none of those emails told us to change the spelling to fourth guidelines? 
set forth instead of the number four? <laughs> okay. Uh, no, nobody spotted that oh, one, okay. Mr. Right. Mayor. <laughs> Until now. <laughs> Those things just jump out. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. All right. Um, so does there anybody have any questions of the chief before we open the public um, hearing? And, and Mr. Mayor, for the record, I do have the... Uh, the two staff that have been mostly involved with crafting the policy, uh, Captain Steiner and uh, Sergeant Jacobson present, if, if somebody did want to ask them more specific questions. All right. Very good. Um, so then, let's see. Regarding police body-worn camera policy, we'll open the public hearing. Is anybody here to address council this evening about the uh, police body-worn camera policy? Anybody here for that public hearing? And we'll close the public hearing. That was pretty painless. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Frankly, Mr. Mayor, I expected it to be painless. Like I said, there's been a lot of vetting throughout the country. There's yep. not much debate to, about what a policy should be any longer. Yep. It's one of the nice things about being a, a later adopter rather than an early adopter. Indeed. Yeah. All right, council. Oh wait, well, that's all we had to do? That's all we had to do, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Nothing to it, then. Yeah. Council Member Geisler? Just since if people were watching this and interested, could you talk about the timeline of when, the, now that the policy you know, is going into implementation, when we would start to be wearing the body cameras? Uh, Council Member Geisler, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, our hope was October 1st. <laughs> uh, obviously, that was uh, not realistic. Uh, that said, I think... Um, I'm not sure where the vendor is, and maybe Captain Steiner might be able to speak on where the vendor is, but the, we're doing our, our due diligence for getting that policy in place. The vendor, however, has to provide the gear and, and do that sort of thing for us. But it's, we, I think I told you before is that uh, the body-worn camera system that we chose supplements the squad camera system that we already have, so it's not a big technological hurdle. We just need to get the cameras here and for some modest training on how they're to be used for our application. But the system itself, how it's used, the officers are already very familiar with record button, how to save them, how to transfer the data and so on. But I think at this point, November 1st or December 1st, somewhere in there, before, definitely before the end of the year. Okay, thank you. I, I think it's just something that maybe we'll wanna bring up at one of our next council members, um, council meetings to say, that they're here, we're starting to use them, so we can make sure that everybody's aware. Indeed. Thank you. Yeah. It was interesting to read through all of those things and see when they could be on and when they couldn't be on. And, mm -hmm. and, all right, um, so then we are up to uh, old business. Item 10 is to consider a water emergency. Mr. Hammer, one more time, huh? Mr. Mayor, that's the recommendation at this time is to continue with current uh, I think we're, we're reaching that end of irrigation season. People are blowing out their lines. Um, depending on how things evolve, maybe we consider other options. But at, at this point, I think um, myself, you, and um, city manager Stemwettel, uh, it appears as if we can just remove the emergency order. Um, so we'll um, discuss that as we get closer to that next council meeting. Okay. Very good. Um, so this is the one where we, or do we have a? Yeah. Okay. So Mr. Mayor, I'll make the motion that we approve the continuation of the watering restriction measures, specifically ending the odd even sprinkling ban and the 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. watering ban. Second. The motion by Geisler, second by Johnson. And that was specifically extending the odd even sprinkling ban, right? Yep. Okay, it sounded like you said specifically ending it. So. Oh, extending. <laughs> okay, uh, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Griscoviak. Yeah, I, I think we can lift this, but this I'll, I'll, I'll accept this uh, for, for another two weeks, right? Through yeah. mm -hmm. the next council meeting in two weeks. The 19th. Okay. Yeah. Got it. That, that's where I was at too. Yeah. I thought, I, I think this has really run its course, but what the heck. Okay, any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. Item 11 is to consider a development agreement for Summer Chase 
fifth edition. Um, Mr. Hammer? Yes, Mr. Mayor, Council. Um, recently, you approved a three lot subdivision on Eagle Street. So, what this does is outlines the requirements of the developer uh, to construct those public improvements, um, pay all such costs. Park dedication is in there, um, sack and whack, connection charges. So it just outlines the responsibilities uh, of the developer to move forward and complete that three lot subdivision. And so I'm happy to answer any specific questions anyone may have. What, what was the final determination of that land of the south that we own? Is that something that can be developed? Because if it is, we should pay them to put a stub in there for, for when we can put a lot there. Do we know? I, Mayor Council, we did look into the feasibility of that. I, the answer was that the way the land was dedicated to the city, there's a timeline for it before it could be developed. And that timeline, it was out a number of years. I think it was a 30 year, Dave, is this sound familiar? 30 year. I can't remember the exact timeline. It wasn't within the next year or two. No, it was okay. many it, years out before the city could even consider development on that property. So probably 10 more years then. Because yeah. this has probably been more than 20 years now. It could be. I apologize. I don't remember the exact Mr. Fernelius, do you recall okay. the specifics? <laughs> Mr. Fernelius? Uh, we did explore it, and, and I want to say it's at least 15 years, if not longer, based on uh, the city acquired it through tax forfeit. And I think when we acquired it, we declared the public purpose to be for stormwater purposes. So to undo that, there's a time frame that we need to essentially allow expire. And so it just, it, from a practical standpoint, I guess we concluded it just wasn't um, something that made sense in terms of, we didn't know if we would be able to actually subdivide it uh, or ultimately you know, sell it for private purposes. So we did discuss it, but concluded it just didn't make sense. Okay. Because, I mean, it just seems, you know, we're responsible for an orderly development, and it just seems to make an orderly development there. There should be just one more house mm -hmm. on that cul-de-sac to finish it off. But um, if, if I might, okay. and, and as part Johnson? of this, as I understand it, we're, we're getting out lot A. Is that right? So, yes. so, I mean, as far as stormwater goes, we've got a big old pile of ground over there for stormwater. So I'm, I'm still a little perplexed as to why, what, what benefit is it to the city of getting out lot A? Can anybody explain that to me? Well, we, instead of what? Because we were, Me the, it came to us, but they wanted to run the, lot the property lines, all lines the way basically back. to infinity. Mm -hmm. And as a council, we voted for them to be regular lots. So what was, what was the question? So the developer is just letting it go tax forfeit or it's part of the development agreement as a part of the stormwater mitigation? What's the... Council Member Johnson, at, at the request of the council, that will be a dedication to the city. So that it will just become an outlot in the back. It can be used for floodplain mitigation and such, but it's not part of their development. It's not part of their stormwater mitigation. It's not part of their stormwater ponding. It's just residual land, if you will, that, that doesn't have any developable properties. Okay, I, I kind of get that, but then... It, it doesn't solve the problem of mitigating the stormwater element to the public purpose of why we received the property in the first place. That, that doesn't help solve that problem. Okay, could it be used as wetland credits in the future? If we were to do an assessment on the wetlands and improve them to a higher quality, yes, okay. it could be. Okay, thanks. Mr. Mayor, yeah. Mr. Fernelius, just so just to clarify, because I think there's a little bit of confusion. We're talking about two different parcels. Yeah, I think your your question related to the adjacent parcel. Which yeah, the property not, part, oh, not part of this yeah. plat, right? I don't, actually, yeah. actually, actually I, don't, I think we were completely we understood. <laughs> yeah. that. Okay. We're, we're all clear on that. <laughs> all right. Yeah, just we're all clear to clarify. on that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> They're going to be conveying that out lot A to the city. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. I think we're all on the same page. All right. So if it's yeah, if it's like 15 years out or something, then I, there's really no value, I suppose, in, in, in stubbing in for that lot because it, it, it seems like eventually, whenever it clears up, that that should be developed. But 
and I'll point out that, that we do have access to it on the public right away, the new cul-de-sac that's provided, and, and having the developer put it in now for a parcel that the city owns, I mean, if that's something the city had an interest in doing, uh, I don't see why we couldn't potentially do that. However, um, having a developer do that on our behalf just doesn't make sense for them. Okay. We can we can do this, and if you recall, we just did a lot similar to this uh, probably just a few months ago up near the golf course, I want to say. We had a tax forfeit property. We oh, yeah. sold the lot. So it, as part of a development just like this, somebody will come in and cut the services in. It's, it's not uncommon. Okay. Very All good. Right. All right. Um, does anybody need anything, need to know anything about this? We, are, we do need a motion, though. So, yes, Your Honor. Councilmember Ray Rower. Uh, I make a motion to approve the development agreement with Shade Tree Construction Incorporated for the construction of the proposed three lot single family subdivision known as Summer Chase Fifth Edition. Second. second. Motion by Ray Rower, second by Carlson. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. And we are on to item 12, and that's to consider a multiple pet permit appeal. Mr. Brody, um, how do you think we should approach this? Your Honor, start with Mr. Start with the chief. Or? The, the, the <laughs> ordinance is a little vague on it. Just says you have the ability to amend or mod or to uh, reject it, um, and then make some reasonable conditions um, on that. I think what we suggested in the memo is that you hear testimony from the appellant, um, the multi-pet permit applicant, and um, and the police chief if necessary, um, and then so that's what I would suggest that we would okay. do. Okay. So so start with the appellant first. Yeah, that seems to make sense since he's the he's the one appealing the decision. Okay. All right. Um, so, Mr. Lutman, you would be up first then. Come up to the dais and give us your name and address. And My name is Todd Lutman. Address is 10559 Martin Street. Uh, requesting appeal for the approval of the multi pet permit. Uh, as Chief said in the hearing we had, only one of the questionnaires came back in favor of renewing it out of all the neighbors. Um, it was made personal, brought up a personal issue, which it affects all neighbors around. It's not just personal. Um, it affects my family's business, the rental property with my renter. She has issues with it. Uh, we have to abide by all your codes pay fees for licensing just to be able to rent and having to deal with complaints from a renter because of those dogs shouldn't have to do that um, and I know the chief mentioned uh, when they bought their house they inherited a fence I'm, I'm sorry but they can't inherit something that the previous owner didn't own um, there is damage to the fence and they attached hooks to their side of the fence without asking permission but that's beside the point there is currently a waiting hearing for a HRO harassment restraining order I guess against Mrs. Bloom and two days later they filed one against me so waiting on that for the personal issues but main thing only one came back um, that would wanted them to renew the permit I don't, I don't know how many came how many questionnaires came back but I know four that said no they didn't want it renewed so yeah that's the uh, um, issue do, in, in a, and can I ask a quick question yet? Okay. Um, and and the and and I know they're they they must be um, the the 
they must be confidential or something because there's no address on the on the on the the letters that were written in opposition. But I know that the one letter written in support was three houses away, and I and I thought that didn't really carry much for me, and I was just kind of wondering how close the other four were, if they were closer or not. But um, that's okay. I guess we can let that one go. Uh, Mr. Lutman, so do you? Do, do you live there and rent there, or do you rent there, or what? My family built uh, the duplex in 1984. Um, after, before my dad passed away, I moved in. When he passed away, I took over the uh, running everything, maintenance. Basically, I'm the only one that does anything with it. Um, I've lived there since 2013. Okay. Second time I've lived there. I first lived on the other side in uh, 1998. Moved out in 2006. And, the, and then the rental license that you mentioned, that's for the other half of the building that's then? For, yeah, that's for 10563. Okay, so you live in half and... I live on 10559 and the other side is 10563. I get it. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, does anybody have any questions for Mr. Lutman? Is there anything else that you would like to present? No, that's about it. Okay. I guess I guess I have a, a Go ahead, question. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Lutman, I, yes. could you give us an idea? I mean, I understand and I've read through all the materials and everything, but how has this personally affected you? You said it's affected your business and it's affected you, but in, in what tangible ways? Uh, I have dogs. Mm -hmm. um, they, whenever I'm outside, uh, they will send their dogs out, charging the fence. Um, she is, on multiple occasions, hung over the fence with a cell phone camera, uh, antagonizing my dogs. The most recent was on the 10th, which my newest rescue sustained an injury to her paw. She ripped a nail. Um, after she was hanging over the fence and with her camera, getting them to go kind of crazy. So injury to the dog, there's no peace. Go outside. If they're not out, try to go in. As soon as they get up the deck, try to let dogs in. They'll let their dogs out, which will turn my dogs around, go right back. They basically have my dogs trained to go to the fence because they know their dogs are there. So I mean, so has it created stress for you? And absolutely. And, and uh, do you feel you've lost some of the enjoyment of your property as a result? Absolutely. Okay. Over the past two weeks, so since the HRO was served, they've actually done what dog owners should do, and you know, corrected their dogs, stopped them, um, not leaving them outside all day to bark at every little thing. But that's a recent change? Since they were served with the HRO, um, yeah. the hearing's on the 12th. So it has actually been peaceful the past week and a half, the way it should be. All right. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Mayor. Okay. Uh, Council Member Carlson. Mr. Lutman, yes. have there been any uh, efforts maybe to work with the Noka County Mediation Services? Uh, I. Just a question. You know. No. There's. Okay. After. Uh, dealing with it for a couple months before I started calling in uh, after they got their third dog, which is the issue. Okay. So. All right. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. That's my Ray Rower. Yes. Can you um, describe the fencing for me, both their yard and your yard, um, and front and backyard? Um, in 2005, me and my father put up a six foot privacy fence all the way across the back of our property. And that's two addresses. So there's a six foot privacy fence there. Um, come up to the front, to the back of the duplex, there's a fence going across to the side neighbor's fences. And the backyard is enclosed in a six foot privacy fence. So they had a chain link up until 
earlier this year or last late last year they put up a privacy fence where the chain link was so is there two fences no there's just my fence going one fence okay. separated okay thank you mr Lutman. thank you and then if we could get the applicant up now Mr. Brody. That we do obviously have within the, uh, in the uh, council memo, we have all of the documentation from the hearing. We have yeah. uh, the yeah. chief's notes. I just want to note that so that people at home that are viewing that we're not just sort of taking this out of context that there was a previous decision. We do have all the supporting documentation for that. that yeah, we've, we've obviously are using. We have pictures of the fence. We have all the information about the, the uh, yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, Jacqueline Blum. 1846, 106th Avenue Northwest. Um, I live in a duplex right behind Mr. Letman. Mm -hmm. um, this is personal. That's all it is. It's flat out personal. We used to be friendly with him and then one day about a year ago he decided I was his worst enemy in the world and started calling the police on me about my dogs. He talks about how the dogs are so disruptive and all the rest of it. Well, his dogs come out to the fence and bark. My dogs run to the fence. The dogs run back and forth at the fence barking like dogs do. Anybody who owns a dog who's got a neighbor who has a dog knows that's what they do. I go out and stop it. It's happened three times since we had our hearing three weeks ago, and all three times, just like I've always done, I go out there right away, call my dogs away. It happened today. I hit the, I have an application on my phone with a, a stopwatch. 20 seconds from the time the dog started barking until I got my dog in the house. 20 seconds. Mr. Lettman talks about how he can't enjoy his yard. Well, for the last two weeks, I've been making a point of keeping my dogs in the house. Mr. Lettman still goes outside only long enough to have a cigarette, and then he's back in his house. I'm not out there. My dogs aren't out there. There's no reason he can't be out there. These are all excuses he's using. I don't know what to say. Everything was fine, then it wasn't. And he, the day after he found out that our permit was approved, he went and filed a harassment order against me because my dogs are harassing him. I don't bring my dogs to the fence. Dogs go to the fence. Dogs walk the fence in their yard. They know their yard. You know, it's, it's ridiculous what he's alleging and trying to turn against me. We spend a lot of time outside. We're outside people. We've got a great big yard. We've got a pool in our yard. We have a nice deck, a real nice patio. We're outside people. Our dogs are outside with us. So I don't know what his point is if he's trying to force me to get rid of my dogs, which, no. If it comes down to I can't have the multiple pet permit, then I guess we'll be prematurely putting the oldest dog down. He's 14, he's deaf, he's blind in one eye. You know, he's still in pretty good health, but if that's what it comes to, that's what I'll end up doing. Um, I just, I'm tired of it. You know, he, he claims that I'm hanging over the fence filming him and his dogs. I stand in my backyard, I was told by an officer because he complained about my dogs all the time. Videotaped his dogs running up to the fence. I started doing that. Then he complains that I'm filming him. His dogs are at the fence barking at my dogs. I'm running out there to get my dogs back. He's standing at the bottom of the steps by his deck having a cigarette staring at me, not calling his dogs back. How is that being a responsible pet owner? You know, it, it's just a constant back and forth, back and forth battle over nonsense. The dogs are not out there barking very long. I've had several officers come out to the house because of him calling. Never once have the dogs been barking. 
his, the, the four letters that we got were Mr. Luckman, his renter, the guy who lives right next door to him, and then his buddy right on the other side. None of the people who live on either side of us even sent a letter in because they don't have a problem with it, either in support or against. You know, it's, it's four people that are all friends of his or his renter. So yeah, the the letters are still my most troubling thing because I think the HRO or whatever that you're gonna you're gonna get that figured out later with the court. But Councilmember Johnson, so I, I guess one important question for me, and, and it's in part the way that I read the ordinance is the ages of your dogs. You said you have three dogs, mm -hmm. and one of them is an older dog. Fourteen. Okay. Uh, the other one's about to turn nine, and the other is eight. Okay. And, and the 14-year-old dog, which is getting up there in dog years, what kind of dog is that? Cocker Spaniel. Okay. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, I've had dogs that have lived way beyond when I thought they were going to go down. But, um, but uh, when do you reasonably anticipate that dog is going to cross the Rainbow Bridge? He's got cancer. Another year tops. The reason I asked the question is um, that if and when that dog um, passes away, um, do you have plans to seek a multiple pet permit in the future, or is it? No, I'll just have two dogs. You'd have two dogs, mm -hmm. and, and there wouldn't be any multiple pet permit needed after that. Is no. that right? Right. All right. That answers my question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Anybody else have any questions? Mr. Mayor. Affirmative Griscoviak. I see the, the four letters from neighbors complaining about the barking and stuff. And that is a problem if your dogs are barking. We all have to admit that. But are, are there police reports or any um, complaints that are proven that these dogs are barking in the public record? Is that yes, a Mr. Mayor. 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 I feel like that one's thrown my direction. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's a handful of police reports. All of them originated with uh, Mr. Lutman um, in terms of complaints of barking dogs. Um, there was one time where Mr. Lutman came with another, a second neighbor to the police department to report the barking dog, but obviously it wasn't at the scene. And for each of those instances, the animal control officer um, responded and didn't find a violation of our ordinance. So there was no citation issued for barking dogs. Okay. Hmm. okay. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, may maybe I- Chief I, Wise. I, yeah, but let's, uh, cause I can see you're struggling with this. All right, so maybe, let's- Maybe they can- I'm gonna, I mean, I'm gonna backtrack yeah, then. Go ahead and sit down and we'll call you back if we have any questions. Thank you. Um, First off, I'll, I'll backtrack to talk about the ordinance itself, and then um, secondarily, I'll address uh, where Councilmember Johnson is going because the multiple pet permit uh, process, application process, whether approving it or denying it, um, in my mind, shouldn't be used as a tool to address a second problem. So in other words, the dogs running the fence or barking probably isn't the 14-year-old Cocker Spaniel that's blind in one eye and can't hear. It's the other two dogs. And if the permit had been denied, those two dogs that do run the fence would still be there. Um, secondarily, so I'll, I'm gonna go back though to the issuance of the permit in the first place, is that the, the description in the ordinance or city code 6-211, um, it just says multiple pet permits shall be issued by the police chief. The things for me to consider are the adequacy of housing and space for the animals, which isn't in question the methods used for sanitation control and to maintain quiet. The ordinance uses the word quiet, but I try to stick to the objective standard of uh, disturbing the peace in our dog uh, ordinance city code. Um, the quality and height of the fencing and the adequacy of an alternative confinement method. The fence is, is a good fence where it's privacy fence a six foot privacy fence on two sides, four foot privacy fence on the side to the north. 
um, that I personally inspected. And then the, the key one for this is prior violations or complaints stated with particularity regarding the applicant's keeping or maintenance of animals on the, pre on the premises. Prior, prior, the word prior is the one that hangs with me. And um, that's always been an important word to me because I go to what was, what was reported to the police department prior to the notice of this multiple pet permit hearing. So people do show up um, regularly. We, I issue 15 of these a year probably, multiplied by 10 and a half years so far that I've been chief. It's quite a few. And, um, and usually they go really well because we talk about mediation. Frankly, they're mediation sessions for the most part about trying to keep um, animals under control. But, but I, like I said, I, I'm reluctant to use this as a tool to address barking dogs when we have a perfectly good barking dog ordinance that if people called it in and the animal control officer found a violation, we do in fact cite people for barking dogs. Now that said, we can go back. Um, I'll just tell you one of the peculiarities of city code, our city code, it defines as unreasonably disturbs the peace and quiet um, as persistent howling, yelping, or barking for a 10 minute period. That's an objective standard, 10 minute period. Frankly, to me personally, that's a long time, but I didn't write the ordinance. I merely follow what the city council directs me to do. Uh, but 10 minutes of continuous barking um, is a pretty big hurdle um, when it comes to a situation like this, and nobody alleged any barking lasted longer than 10 minutes ever. So. That's my thoughts on it, Mr. Mayor. If I was on the council, I probably would have ran a tape for 10 minutes of barking and we would have determined that was too long. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure exactly how old that standard was, but it's been, that's been the standard since I've been the police chief. And, yeah. um, and I don't know where it came from necessarily, but it's the one that, like, mm -hmm. again, I try to make these very objective. I don't want my personal feelings regarding dogs or cats, for that matter, to weigh in on these conversations. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. Councilor Member Can I ask a question of the chief there then? In those uh, police calls that were made, either the police or the uh, animal control went out there, did they witness any barking? I mean, I mean, if they barked for nine minutes, you know, then they're in compliance, but can you tell me a little bit about that? Uh, yes, I can. Um, Let's see, I think I brought two. And I apologize if it's in the packet and I didn't see it. Uh, no, that's, oh, that's good. Having this conversation in public is, is worth having, I think. Uh, the first complaint that I brought the incident report for was May 10th of 2021. Um, he, uh, Mr. Lettman reported that Blum has multiple dogs that are a nuisance. Um, the dogs charge at his fence that's shared by him and doesn't allow him to take his dogs outside. Now that said, charging a, a privacy fence, in my mind, isn't a six foot privacy fence that there's no hope of a dog hopping over or jumping over. You know, I'm, not, I'm not even sure what to make of that in terms of, of um, I, I can see where that would be annoying, but again, not a code violation that I know of for, for a dog to charge a fence that it can't get through or over. Um, he advised the dogs are digging at his fence in that it was a continuous dispute between him himself and uh, Blum. The animal control officer said, um, I advised Letman, she just wrote, I advised Letman that the dogs were not at large and to contact dispatch if there were any violation of city ordinances. Um, they mentioned that the dogs continuously bark nonstop, unprovoked, and the animal control officer advised um, Mr. Bello, who, who I believe um, the Blums mentioned, to record the dogs barking and to contact dispatch while the barking was happening so that the animal control officer could respond. But it would be a, a 10 minute recording would be considered sufficient evidence for issuing a citation. The other, the other one was um, a month and a half later, June 22nd, 2021. Um, again, Lutman advised Blum lets her dogs outside at the address, which eventually provokes his dogs. 
Lutman said he can't let his dogs out without them being provoked. Lutman advised he had video footage of the dogs charging the fence and barking, um, which I don't dispute. Um, I made contact with Lutman at his residence as the animal control officer. To observe the complaint firsthand, I observed that Lutman's dogs were well behaved and well trained. I did not observe Blum's dogs charge at the fence. I advised Lutman that there were no immediate violations. Um, basically, that was the end. So those are the kinds of incident reports that I get to look at. Okay, thank so, you. So, Chief, so if we, if we, um, and I, I have to go back and look at our choices again. So if we affirm the approval, that doesn't preclude if, what happens if, if they do record a, a violation does, is that an automatic loss of a multi-pet permit or, or can that be? Um, I'm just wondering because this, this whole HRO thing kind of, in my mind, kind of almost cancels out both of the testimonies and, I'm, and I would just kind of like other neighbors to call if there's actually legitimate barking issues. And if there is and they go out and record 10 minutes, is that grounds for dealing with it? a separate citation. Well, yeah, the city attorney is going to, well, I'll just tell you first off, it's never come up uh, anybody asking for a multiple pet permit to be revoked. That said, we issue lots of barking dog um, citations right. uh, because, they're, again, it's a very objective standard. And, um, and if somebody were to observe, and frankly, we tell everybody, if you, we can handle barking dogs. I've never had a barking dog situation happen in this city that we have been unable to manage at some point or another. Mm -hmm. If a dog gets to the point where it violates the ordinance, it's a misdemeanor and um, court appearance for the dog owner. Okay. And it's, it's just never gotten to that stage. Usually that, we'll say hammer, or even just the threat of that hammer is enough to resolve the issue so that, that I, I just haven't seen that barking dog ordinance be ineffective in dealing with barking dogs. And so, like I said, I try to avoid not, or try to avoid conflating the two things, multiple pets from barking dogs. They're, they're two different things. The, mm -hmm. the multiple pets that do catch my attention are uh, things such as smell or, you know, animal feces or something sure. like that, where, where you can clearly see having too many dogs would create a smell that nobody needs to put up with, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. but, um, but, yeah, when it comes to the barking dog, we, we can address... Uh, barking dogs. We have five animal control officers that work for the city from basically 7 a.m. to 10:30 p.m. Um, I can't think of a barking dog situation that we couldn't manage if there was an actual violation. Now that said, there's nobody in this room that doesn't um, disagree that a dog parking for five minutes six times a day would really annoy me. Mm -hmm. That would truly annoy me. Wouldn't be a, a ordinance violation. Um, but that's not the situation that I'm being, that's being described here, and it's not one that I know what to do with because then we start getting into subjective standards on how to manage it. And when it comes to these sort of things, I just try to keep it as objective as I possibly can so that it's consistent, one applicant to the next. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Carlson. Chief Wise, so this is renewal. So about how long ago is that last application? Uh, Council Member Carlson, yeah, and actually that's a point of contention too because the, f the first application was in 2000, was um, June, I guess, of 2020, first one year application, and then city re code requires an annual renewal. That one was done without a multiple pet permit hearing, of course related to COVID. And in city code, it says the police chief may conduct a um, neighborhood right. meeting regarding the application. So. Uh, based on the absence of police reports at that time, I just granted the multiple pet permit um, based on the applicant meeting all the objective criteria that's in the ordinance, um, the fence and so on. And um, so, the so it's, a it's a renewal. Then. So, but this is the first crack that neighbors who received a survey were able to provide an anonymous feedback. Um, so those surveys, um, so the surveys didn't happen that in 2020. I was also uh, wondering, Chief, and I mentioned this a little bit uh, um, earlier. I mean, now we're kind of in um, HRO land, you know, but 
uh, early on this more for the public. Do you think this is something that maybe an uh, intervention with the No County Mediation Services, maybe they could be helpful in situations like this earlier on? Councilmember Carlson, indeed. Yes, the city of Coon Rapids does contract with medi Mediation Services of Anoka County to mediate neighborhood disputes. They're very good at it, mm -hmm. but both parties need to be willing to go. That's generally the, the rub. Um, but they're very good at that sort of thing, and it's what they're for. It's a budget item that you approve every year, and we use it for a number of things. Thank you. Mr. Yeah. Mayor. Yeah. Councilmember Johnson. Can you tell me how many um, surveys did you send out approximately, or, or what's the general policy um, that you use to send out things into the surrounding community? Yeah, Councilmember Johnson, I, I don't know how many surveys were sent out, but it's 350 feet. So, okay. and it's just a GIS thing where we just 350 feet and it provides address labels and we shoot them out to everybody. So I. I think typically it's probably in the 50 range. It's not yeah, a small so, number. So it encompasses dozens of houses. Anyway. Yeah, and it's in that neighborhood has a lot of duplex right. uh, homes and townhouses to the south and those sorts of things. Sort Thank of you. Thing. All right. Well, in front of us we have um, three choices to affirm, reject, or add any reasonable conditions or delete any conditions previously imposed. Um, I'm, uh, I, I really am swayed by those four letters of complaint, three of them for sure, because they took time to fill them out. Can I have one more thing? Um, it's a compromise. Mr. Lettman, sure, come on up. Offer a compromise, Charlie and Duke are not a problem. Bodie, the barking is, that's the problem. If they can put a bark collar, something that would, you know, get them to stop, I, I would be good for that, with that. But Bodie is the one that causes all the barking. And that He's was the issue dog. And that and that's that yeah you know, that was in our packet, but that's that's the husky. But. I mean, if they're if they're willing to do something, get a collar, citronella, bark collar, whatever, to prevent him from doing that. I don't think it, having three dogs would be an issue. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Your Honor. Yeah, Councilmember Johnson. I. I, I I've frankly been swayed somewhat by the testimony and the presentations put on by some of the people here, and so I'm going to make a motion to affirm the police chief's approval of the multiple pet permit at 1846-106 Avenue Northwest. Second. This was a motion and a second by Johnson, and that's the direction I'm leaning as well. Um, but I really would encourage if any of the others have legitimate complaints that they call the police as soon as they yeah. hear that dog barking. Yeah, I would, I would like to say just a few things on oh. it, um, yeah. Your Honor, if you, if you don't mind. Councilmember Johnson. Um, I, you know, I really want to thank the, the neighborhood um, members that are here, the Lums, Mr. Lutman as well. Um, for coming and talking to us. It's not easy to talk mm -hmm. about these things that um, our frustrations between neighbors. Really want to thank Mr. Lutman for the last comment um, because I think it showed um, a level or at least an openness to compromise and to really get at the heart of what kind of the issue or concern is. Um, I look at this ordinance as something um, that allows homeowners, and I appreciate that we have this in the city of Coon Rapids, the flexibility when they have a couple of dogs and they're trying to plan for what the next dog is going to be or whatever to, to have more than two, um, but they have to go through the right channels and make the right applications, and they, they've done that. They've gone through the right um, channels and, and made the right applications for a multiple pet permit. Um, I, you know, I think 
um, the Blums have heard that there are certain neighbors that they have, and it's and it's not just Mr. Lutman um, that that have been uh, negatively impacted, and it seems like it's largely in part because of the the barking of really one dog. It's not not your 14 year old cocker spaniel. That's the that's the difficulty in managing it, and I'm not here to suggest to anyone how they should try to control their dogs. I mean, I've had to go through the whole barking dog thing with a dog of my own, and it was a frustration to me. Um, and and I know it was at one point in time a frustration to a neighbor too, and so I had to take it very seriously um, in handling it. But none of these things really rise to the level, um, in my mind, of being insurmountable and also being the kind of thing that we should disallow um, members of our community from having, you know, multiple pets and having a kind of a succession plan on what their pets are going to be. Um, and so, um, well, I think everybody comes here sincere about their frustrations or concerns and everything. I think our role is to be a little bit, is to listen and understand, but also to be a little bit dispassionate as we look at the law and the ordinances and what they allow. Um, and there may come a time, you know, that other neighbors in the neighborhood decide because they're handling rescue dogs that, that they would like a multiple pet permit too. And, and, and then we want to have a, an open and fair and dispassionate kind of assessment of that. So um, those are many of the reasons that, that I think ultimately I come around to this. I have to be honest, the first time I read it, I, uh, I, you know, I was almost leaning in, in the other direction because I was concerned about the neighborhood but it gratifies me to hear that the police department and the city attorney sent out those notices to a, a big section of the neighborhood. And frankly, four out of that many, especially in light of all of the circumstances and in light of the circumstances that if you really didn't have a problem, you weren't gonna say anything and return them, go to the trouble of going on public record about you know, not having a problem. Um, I think that uh, ends up supporting the applicant um, ultimately in this. And so that's where I'm at on it. Okay. Thank you. Your Honor. Council Member Rauer. Um, for me, in um, thinking about this, this really comes down to listening to Chief Wise and the trust and respect I have in, um, in listening to him. and his comments and talking about how the multiple pet permit really its intention isn't for um, a barking dog issue or an annoyance issue. It's really, its intention would be more for a resident that cannot manage having the multiple pets in terms of cleanliness or in terms of um, just the ability to feed all of them in that type of a situation and that is not the case in this situation at all. Um, this falls more into that annoyance for me in listening to it. It falls more into an annoyance issue. Um, unfortunately, dogs charging a fence, it's, it is disruptive and it, and it is annoying, um, but it's not uh, against our, our city ordinances. Um, as long as that noise isn't continuing on for 10 minutes, um, it doesn't it doesn't, it isn't against a city ordinance. And again, I, I agree with other council members. If, if it is becoming something where it gets longer than that, residents do use your ability to call and call that in. Um, but dogs do charge fences. It, that's, that's what they do. Um, and, and many, that's in their nature. And having dogs, that, that's a part of it. Um, so, uh, I really, really hope that you will find a way to work this out and, and definitely take Council Member Carlson's suggestion of using that mediation. It can be a, a really much more successful way of working this out um, than an HRO or these other methods. Um, thank you. So we do actually do have two standards though for, for animals because we've got our statute for the barking dog, that's an objective thing. Um, but for the multi-pet permit, we have a higher standard. 
because it says it is unlawful um, to allow the animals to disturb surrounding property users. You know, that's that's more subjective. Yeah, so it's actually you know, subjective. So. Yeah, and, and, and to maintain the animals in such a manner as... Um, and it's unlawful to allow or to maintain the animals in such a manner as to create a nuisance by way of noise or to odor or otherwise. So I, th I think we do have a higher standard of this, and I think we do have reason to reject this. But unfortunately, in this particular situation, it's not going to fix anything because all we're going to do is take out the old dog that really kind of deserves to, to be able to you know, have a peaceful rest of his life and it's it's not going to take care of the barking dog so it's not going to get us where we need to go so i'm still going to affirm the uh affirm the approval and then just hope that either we get some objective evidence against the barker or things work out so we have a motion and a second to affirm the police chief's approval of the multiple pet permit is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. Again, thank you so much for coming in. Um, I, I hope you can work this out. Um, we are on to item 13, to consider resolution 21-40, sub eight, authorizing staff to gather plans and specs for Coon Rapids Ice Center Mechanicals and authorize solicitation of bids. Um, anything you want to hit the highlights of? I mean, we kind of have it all down from our workshop, but uh, sure, uh, Mayor ring. Uh, the agenda item before you tonight is, as you mentioned, um, authorizing staff to move forward with preparations of plans and specifications. The ICE Center is in need of some mechanical repairs. We are currently researching those options and a recommendation for contract award would come back to you at the November 3rd meeting. So this is just allowing us to continue our work, uh, get the plans and specs and go out to bid for it, all of which would be coming up on October 15th, the bid time period. Anybody have any questions of this? Oh, Council Member Geyser. We need to make sure that our lovely ice center is functioning <laughs> and has ice. So with that, I will make a motion to adopt resolution number 21-440 sub 8, ordering the preparation of plans and specifications and ordering advertisement of bids for the 2021 Coon Rapids Ice Center Mechanicals Project. Second. Second. Motion by Geyser, second by Carlson. Discussion? Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Griscoviak. I just think it's worth noting to the public here that, you know, our ice, our ice center was down. I mean, the, the mechanical equipment uh, reached its useful life and actually failed a little bit prematurely. And, you know, we've got a tremendous investment in that center and we have to get this thing back up and running. So uh, it looks like it's going to be a costly endeavor. Um, but we have to get the big bidding process ready. We have user groups that use that that center and uh, we just we have to move forward with getting this out and specified well to be clear it is it's operating right now but True. it's costing us twenty six thousand dollars a month for right. the extra cooling <laughs> unit so let's get her fixed so let's get her fixed yeah. all right so we have a motion and a second any further discussion hearing none all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. opposed and that motion carries Item 14 is to consider installation services agreement with Ferguson Enterprises LLC. And this is, we approximately have 15,000 residential water meters that are reaching the end of their useful life. Uh, staff has negotiated a replacement program for these meters to occur over the next four years. Um, and uh, we approved a budget amendment to the water fund in the amount of $550,000 to complete the 21, 2021 replacements um, which would be approximately 2,700 meters. Um, does anybody have any questions? We, Mr. Hammer, anything else on that you want to hit on? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, Council, this is just solely for the installation component. We buy the meters directly. Uh, we get them installed for, what is it, $57 or $59, and that covers all appointment scheduling, notices, everything. So I, I believe it's a good deal, and I'd recommend approval. Oh. Yeah. All right. Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Ray Rower? No, go ahead. <laughs> 
I make a motion to approve the installation services agreement with Ferguson Enterprises LLC and authorize staff to execute the agreement. Second. Motion by Ray Rower, second by Carlson. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. Item 15 is to consider resolution 21-103, hang on, let me draw a tear here. <laughs> Declaring a city council vacancy in Ward 3. Um, Ward 3 council member Wade Demmer, the former Ward 3 council member Wade Demmer, has notified staff that he had moved out of the ward effective September 30th, and per the city charter, a vacancy in the membership of the council shall be deemed to exist if a person elected thereto removes from the city or removes from the ward to which elected. Um, and that is what former council member Demmer did as he moved from Ward 3 into Ward 4 and effectively when he moved into his house vacated his seat. Based on the city's past practices, uh, the staff is recommending that council appoint an eligible person to fill the remainder of council member Demmer's term. And should we wish to approve an appointment of an eligible person, uh, staff is recommending advertisement for applications from eligible residents in Ward 3, accepting applications. Well, let's, let's just hold off on that until we have our discussion. And then we'll give all those dates again yeah. so that everybody can write them down. Okay. Everybody in Ward 3, that is. Yes. <laughs> um, anything on that, Mr. Or Ms. Lensmeyer or Mr. Stemwell, that you want to? Nope, Mr. Mayor, I'll leave it up to the council to discuss. Okay. Have we ever had a special election with only a year to go? <laughs> Mayor Council, not um, that we can ever recall or have seen yeah. in our history. Uh, state law does mandate a special election when there's two years or more left mm -hmm. on a term. Obviously, that's not the situation we're sure. in. Special elections are expensive and would add and take quite a bit of time to get set in motion. Um, so it's just not practical. We don't think at this point to consider that option, but certainly that option exists if council were interested. By the time you have a primary <laughs> and then a general and... <laughs> it's going to be the next general. Yeah, yeah, it'll be the next general or the next primary, yeah. yeah. All right. So does, does council, does anybody have any objection to declaring a vacancy or, or not? No, that's going to happen it's on its own. Yeah. Um, looking for an appointment instead of a special election, any objection to that? No. All right. No. no. Done. Mm -mm. So then. So, uh, do you want all the motions? Sure. Okay. Councilmember so, Geisler. And Mr. Brody, do I need to do those independently or can I do them in one motion? I'll probably do them all in one motion. Okay. Um, first, I'll make a motion to adopt resolution 21 103 declaring a vacancy in the office of council member for Ward 3 and move to consider a, a motion that the vacancy be filled by appointment within the next 30 days. And three, schedule a special working session meeting to interview applicants for the Ward 3 council member position for October 26, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. Second. Motion by Geisler, second by Johnson. I wish I could think of a question that I know for sure Wade would ask, but I, <laughs> I, I, I can't. <laughs> Um, but I am sure he would want to encourage everybody that in Ward 3 that is feeling this community spirit and really wants to serve their community to uh, step up and, and fill out an application. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Mayor, maybe the, the key um, would be to, and we can maybe do this after we vote, but for staff to provide clarity on where would the application be, what are the steps to apply, all of those kinds of things, mm -hmm. I think um, will be key. I don't know if we need that before or after the vote. Well, we can do that in discussion, okay. and because that was one of the things I didn't get to. So the, we're looking to accept applications through October 18th, 2021. And Ms. Lensmeyer, should they send those to you? Mr. Mayor, members of council, yes. As soon as we get this approval, I will send an email off to uh, Jennifer Anderson and the communications team is all ready to go with getting the word out. There'll be a link to the application. It'll be a fillable PDF. You can do it online and email it back to me, or you can have a paper copy, drop it off here at City Hall, whatever works. Okay, excellent. Um, so we'll be accepting applications through October 18th, 
and then we'll be scheduling a special work session for October 26th to interview applicants. Um, if I recall, we, we as a council went through the applications and determined um, just a select few to interview, right? It seems like we went from like 10 applications to like five interviews or something um, based on qualifications and things. Yeah. Mayor Council, um, certainly that option would exist and, and perhaps, you know, we could make the decision when we understand how many applications are in. Sure. Um, however, the, I do plan to discuss this with Council at the October 12th work session. Um, obviously, we won't have answers by then of who is applying, but certainly I will want to talk to you about the structure of the interviews, the interview questions, uh, the scoring matrix, or how Council wants to go about making a decision about an appointment, things of that nature. Um, if at that time we wanted to identify kind of a cutoff that if it's more than six applications, we'd like to reduce it to six or fewer, or if it's six or fewer, we just go with those six and interview everybody. I mean, those are decisions council can make. Sure. And then the process by which we narrow that down, uh, we can talk about as well. Uh, yeah, it, that makes, I forgot, yeah. we still have a few weeks here to figure that sure. out, so. Yeah. But the key date is applications in to the city clerk by, by October 18th. Close business. You got yeah. it. Okay. Close the business. Yeah, not, yeah, none of this midnight on the 18th, right? <laughs> Close the business. All right. So we have a motion and we have a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. And we are on to the open mic portion of the meeting. Is anybody here to address council for open mic this evening? Open mic? No. All right, I don't have any reports on previous open mics and we are up to other business. Um, and we're missing our fire chief tonight. And we have our big fire, fire, fire department open house on Saturday, but it's an open house in the park. That's gonna be a very fun day, I think. Yeah. As long as the weather is nice. Mayor and you know. Council, that's right. Given um, circumstances where uh, public won't, wouldn't have been able to tour the kind of back areas, the uh, other areas of the fire stations, we decided it made more sense this year to just combine equipment, combine demonstrations at one site and an outside facility. So we're gonna be at Sand Creek Park from 10 a.m. to 12 or noon on October 9th. Uh, we'll be Sparky the Fire Dog, cooking fire demonstration, free cookies and drinks, all the equipment that you would wanna look at, all those normal elements and hopefully Next year we can go back to the formal former model, but if this is really successful, maybe we stick with that. So, well, I, I touring the fire stations is really interesting. It's mm -hmm. fun. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But but to have everything at one spot, you know, mm -hmm. because you do have you've got the LifeLink helicopter that often goes to one station, mm -hmm. and then you have various demonstrations that they have they to hit all three up. stations yep. in two hours yeah. and have cookies <laughs> at each. You know, <laughs> right, Mr. Mayor. Is, is, is that new engine going to be delivered by then? I, no, that engine will not no? be available, okay. I don't believe. No. <laughs> They're really shining up the other ones, okay, though. Yeah. making a real shiny <laughs> ones. Old ladder yeah. one was going around. <laughs> yeah. And then, All Mr. Right. Mayor? Council Member, um, Council Member Geisler? So next week, Wednesday the 13th, if I've got my dates right, um, the Mississippi River Corridor Critical Area. This is going to be a webinar. Um, and while you may think that it's just the properties along the river, it actually extends out farther um, so people across the street and across that next street. Um, but it's talking about um, the, the detail and zoning rules of how those properties are going to have to be managed um, with the new um, rules that are going to be coming out for that area that would be adopted sometime next year. But so if you live anywhere within a couple blocks of the river, um, this is a webinar that you could attend and l learn about um, that new zoning rule. If you could drive a golf ball to the river from your house, you ought to be paying attention to yeah. this one. <laughs> That's to be pretty close. And, and be really close for, for, me. for you, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, and then I guess I would like to remind everybody that tomorrow, no, Thursday, Thursday, October 7th, is the uh, Coon Rapids Rotary Club's Sampler 21 Oktoberfest, 630 to 9 at Bunker Hills Event Center. 
$40 per ticket and lots of beer vendors, distillery, and <laughs> fabulous Kendall's food. Mm -hmm. um, anything on that? Anything else on that? Does that kind of cover it? Yeah. Tickets are available online. You know, tickets are available online. You can search the Coon Rapids Rotary Club um, and find their website. You can also go to Eventbrite and buy tickets directly there or the night of. I'll mention that the proceeds of this event go to fund a number of different events, uh, programs within the community, primarily though the Respect Retreat at Coon Rapids High School, mm -hmm. which is a terrific program um, that uh, each freshman class goes through this year. I think they're gonna try to do two classes. Um, so all of the proceeds primarily from this event go to, to fund that and it's a huge help to Coon Rapids High School because otherwise they wouldn't be able to put the program on. Mm -hmm. oh, and it's an opportunity to listen to some great music and play Hammer Hammerschlagen. Hammerschlagen, you got yeah. it. <laughs> Registered trademark Hammerschlag. Yeah, registered. Yeah, the real deal. We're not going to get sued afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. Any other business to come before council this evening? All right. Ward three residents, watch for those. Uh, watch for that appointment information. Get your applications into the city clerk. And I guess I'd look for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Right. Second. Motion by Carlson. Second by Geisler to adjourn. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We're adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>